Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Core 4 Business Planning webinar. We thank you all for joining us. Today we'll be covering Part 2, Core 3 and 4, presented by Becky Mays. Uh, my name is Linda Hembry. Hopefully you all joined us for our last, uh, last webinar dealing with business planning, where Becky from People Incorporated was able to share her insight and expertise into the area of business planning. For many of you all who have uh, ventured that you're starting through your organization as a social enterprise or for-profit arm, or you are helping other uh, small owners or micro business owners who are to you know, manage their businesses and uh, technical assistance for them. So I just want to, before I introduce Formally, today I am going to go over just a few things that we'll be covering. First of all, we're we'll going to be talking about cash flow uh, management and operations, marketing, and uh, success planning. I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, Becky, when you get on the line. Um, but today, it's a little housekeeping items. We want to make sure that you, you that your lines are muted because the webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions. What you can do is just type your questions in on the Q&A tab, and I will be monitoring those throughout the webinar and be able to uh, answer your questions through um, either come over to Becky as she's speaking, or we will um, just open up the lines and allow you to ask your question because right now we have a, a lot of people on the line. We have roughly about 12, but as, as more people begin to join, then uh, we may not be able to open up the line for questions. Uh, so we'll attempt to get to all of the questions if we can. There's a lot of material that needs to be covered today. So I um, just want to let you know that um, you know, it is available to you. Or you can send me a private chat if you have a question about some sort of uh, you know, technical issue or something of that nature. Um, and you have um, that sort of thing. Anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Becky Mays. She is a graduate of help if I have the right bio. She's a graduate of the King College with a bachelor's degree in business administration. She is a certified credit counselor, a licensed coach, uh, and a clinic facilitator for of corporate U. She is also the uh, graduate of Lead Bristol College. She also teaches business basics, credit building, customer service, leadership, marketing, social media, several classes uh, there in Southwest Virginia where she is, her agency is located. And she also helps to train uh, business owners in the area of business development. So I am going to go ahead. Oh, yeah, I did want to mention that at the um, 20 conference, she will also be teaching a more exhaustive version of this course which will include, she'll go a little bit deeper into some of the subject matters. So look for her webinar, or excuse me, her um, workshop at the 2012 conference as we are uh, hosting it in New York, right in New York City. So hopefully uh, all or many of you will be joining us for that. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor over to Betty Mays. Great. Thanks, Linda. You're welcome. Well, everyone, uh, welcome back to part two of the Core 4 Business Planning course. Um, as Linda said, we're going to go over today Core 3 and Core 4. Last week we went over Core 1 and Core 2. Um, so today we're going to cover cash flow planning and operations planning. And after the last webinar, I had several people email me um, wanting to know how how they could um, purchase this curriculum and be trained in it. We actually purchased it from um, the Entre Northeast Entrepreneur Fund, um, and it's through an EL Learning Process um, Center. You can actually go through the training with them and purchase the curriculum from them. And I believe the website is Core 4 Online. But if you're interested in, in offering this, the clients you serve 
uh, please let me know, and and you can send me an email. My contact information will be on this presentation, and I'll be happy to send you more information on it. Um, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got a lot of stuff to cover today and a short time to cover it in. Um, as Linda said, we are going to be offering this also at the conference. It, this is normally and can be a 12-hour course. So I'm, when I'm working with our clients and they're taking this class, uh, they come over four nights and they take a core each night because it covers four cores. Uh, and so condensing two cores down into an hour is a little tough, but you can at least get the idea of, the, of what um, content we cover in the course, and it can be helpful, hopefully, for your business uh, or for you helping your clients that are thinking about starting the business. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, like I said, last week we covered success planning and market planning, and we'll go ahead today and start with cash flow planning and then lead into operations planning. I'm going to go ahead and flip through a few slides here so we can get started. Okay, when you're thinking about cash flow planning, a lot of times when we're working with clients, they will say, you know, I'm really good at providing this service or building this product or providing um, um, a certain service to folks, but I don't have a clue on how to keep books. Um, I don't have a clue on cash flow planning. So what I think about this, it's made it really simple as far as learning how to do a cash flow because it's not as complicated as people may think and they immediately say, I'm not good with numbers. And so we try to make it as easy as we can for them in learning what a cash flow is. And the cash flow without the fuel for your business, your cash is the fuel. You can't be successful. And I keep telling them, you know, you, you hear that, that saying all the time, cash is king, and that is so true because without the cash in your business, uh, your business will, will survive. So you've got to be able to understand the cash flow to understand how to keep that money coming in and flowing and how, how to keep that cash flow going around, coming in and going out um, in a timely manner. So what goes into a cash flow? Timing, that's when the cash moves in and moves out. The amount, how much is coming in and, and going out. You definitely don't want um, more going out than, than is coming in. Sources, where's the cash coming from, what are you using it for, um, and the relationship to the business activity to produce cash or using the cash. Sources. Um, unfortunately, uh, we all don't have that big nest egg sitting on our kitchen table full of cash. So I to think about other sources other than our, than our contributions to the business. Um, are we able to get a, a loan at the bank to provide cash? Maybe um, your city EDA has some opportunities. Um, I a lot of cities are promoting opportunities to start businesses in their downtowns to, to boost the economy. Uh, some of the things you're going to use it for, you're going to need equipment for your business, uh, inventory, working capital. A lot of the, the business owners that we work with that come in, they're looking, they just need um, sometimes just equipment or have their equipment they need some working capital, you know, just to just to get through a month. Maybe they had a really big contract, but they're thinking, okay, I, I need the money to, to provide this service. They won't get a check for, you know, three months to pay for it. So you've got to think on ways they can get that money coming in and going out at the right time. And just like um, um, businesses don't want anything. And to make Profit business owners need to focus on the needs of businesses, not their personal wants. Your business doesn't need to drive a white Cadillac unless you're a limousine service. You um, and when somebody comes in and they want to start out and have that big retail store, I will say all the time, you know, do you really need that to start this business? So you really got to think, what does your business need? This is what what you want for that big business. And this is something and when you're working with clients, you really have to help them um, figure out which one is really a want and which one is really a need. So we into a little exercise and you will have a copy of it and I'm gonna I'm gonna put it up on the screen in just a second on how to do a cash flow. Now normally when I'm doing a class um, 
in person and we can actually work together on this. I'll give you um, a little bit of time to do this, like 15 minutes to actually go through the little cookie jar exercise and learn how. Unfortunately, since we're pressed for time, um, I'm going to kind of go through it quickly, but I'll, you'll at least have an idea. And I'm going to put up on your screen a copy of the, um, the actual cash flow. I think I am. There you go. Um, where I usually work with our clients and say, okay, let's see if you can figure this out. This is about as elementary as you get as far as a cash flow. And even with your business, with find a lot more um, dollar amounts and a lot more products, it still works the same way. So you don't need to make it any harder than it is. So let's look at this. And um, I wish you all could print this out somehow so you could kind of do it. Um, but you can before I, I take it off the screen. Um, we're going to say this is your plan for your cash flow, uh, your personal plan for your week, okay? And on Monday morning, you start with $10. And you can see... Um, standard Monday, cash on hand is zero, and under that it says cash in from the cookie jar. Every day you pull $10 out of the cookie jar and put it in there. Um, but this morning, on Monday morning, you park in the ramp for $3, you donut and coffee for $2, you get soap, soda from a deli for lunch for $5, you buy newspaper, a dollar. your total cash out is $11. Well, you only have ten dollars, so you take your cash out minus eleven. For that day, you're already a negative one. So you see that uh, the negative one carries back up to Tuesday. And you can also see it how it is here on your screen. Um, kind of go through the same thing. Unfortunately, the other sheet up there and fill in the blank. So you can see we start out Tuesday with a with a minus a dollar. Um, so I'll also pull in ten dollars from the cookie jar again, and then we spend on Tuesday. We're spending twelve dollars. We put in a rent for three dollars. We have lunch with a friend for nine, which equals twelve dollars. So on Tuesday we're already negative three. Now I always point out to my clients is this works the same way with your business, okay? The cash on hand can be the cash you already have at the business. The cash in can be your accounts receivable, money you have coming in for sales. Your account could be the money you're using for inventory, um, you're using to pay the monthly bills for the business, anything you have to pay the expenses for the business. So your ending cash is going to be whatever's left of that to carry over to the next day. So then today, it kind of works the same way. Um, you start out the day with a negative three dollars. Plus, you put your ten dollars in. That's your accounts receivable that you've received for the day. You spend three dollars that day, so you've done a little better. Um, and then your two positives to the good dollars that, that day. Thursday, it works the same way. You put the, you receive ten dollars in. You spend thirteen out. You're, you're then to the good a dollar. Let's see just from this little exercise how this works. Um, so by the end of the week, on you started out, you know you were good, um, plus one dollar. Put your money in, your ten dollars from the cookie jar. And that day, you know, with a business, you might have spent more on inventory that day, more than you had. So now you're negative one to finish up, and it just keeps carrying over. Um, I've also put in an example of really. That was, if you get a look at the one we just did, you know, that's for a week. But if you look here on the next page, when I'm working with a business, this is more what the cash flow projection will look like by month. Um, and just to give you an idea, there's a lot more details um, that you, you can see down in the cash out. You know, we break it down to wages, electric, telephone. You can see all the expenses down there. Um, this is more like what a cash flow is going to look like for a business. It seems like when we're working with entrepreneurs, it really is helpful if they do the cash flow by, by this QR exercise. It kind of helps them understand how to do a cash flow. So 
So that way they're not as uh, afraid when they're first working with you and someone. So, uh, we have clients all the time say, you know, I really I understand now the cash flow, but I'm having problems on how to adjust the profit I have on my products. Um, and again, they try to look at it um, instead of trying to look at it in the easy way. They really are they're afraid to even. Um, they're like, I'm not good at math, so I can't do it. Well, that's not the case. You need to make it easy for yourself. And that just breaks it down to make it extremely simple. Um, it's not always this simple, because we work with businesses that offer a variety of products. So it's not as simple as pricing a candy bar and what your profit is on one candy bar. But if you look at this, um, we'll do this little napkin test, the cash of a candy bar. The cash of a candy bar is a dollar. Let's say you sell candy bars in your business. Cash to purchase one candy bar from a vendor is 60 cents. So your cost is 60 cents. So you have a candy bar for a dollar. You pay 60 cents for it. Your cash from the sale is going to be 40 cents. That's pretty simple. But when you get into actually figuring this out on your products um, for yourself, it's, it's a little bit harder. And so we try to make it, um, if you think of it as a simple way, it's easier for you to figure out what your gross profit margin is in your sales. Um, this should be driven into the bones of a business owner. Um, it's a formula that I think will help in figuring, figuring out how much your sales should be for the entire year. And we have found it to be helpful to our clients. So you can use any number. Say you want to take home $20,000 a year from your business um, by selling candy bars, okay? That, um, if you want to take home $20,000, you're thinking, hey, how many candy bars do I have to sell? Well, you divide the $20,000 um, by your gross profit margin, which is the $0.40 cents or 0 .4, and it will come out to $50,000. So you'll have to have $50,000 in sales in one year in order to take home $20,000 from that business. And it's saying, okay, say you're getting so big now, you want to hire two employees. So you want to take home $20,000 plus hire two employees at $15,000 per year. Okay, so now you're up to $50,000. You need $1,000 to do this. How much is it going to take? Well, if you're still only making $0.40 cents off each candy bar, it's going to take $125,000 in sales in one year. Keep going, and and it keeps going. Um, and when you're working with a business, you know it's not as simple as the candy bars, but you're really able to help them um, understand, and they can kind of figure it out for themselves after you put it to them. Um, let them know and and help them to understand the simple way. If you want a business site and say it rents for thousand dollars a month, including utilities, well you have to figure out if you've got the sales in order to cover that. Um, you figure it out again, $1,000 times 12 months, 12000 plus your 20000 under draw, plus your employees of 30000 So now you're spending 62000 a year. Just run the business and to, and to get your candy bars to, that you need to sell. So now you do the same thing, and you divide that by your, your gross profit margin. And now you're going to have to have $155,000 in sales in one year in order to pay your rent, your sales, your employees, and to purchase the candy bars that you're going to sell. This will give you an example. Well, it's Pie Bakery. Pies for nine fifty each. Sometimes when I do this exercise, it really gets people thinking, and they're like, well, maybe I don't want to do that business. Um, the cost to make that pie is $3. So you've got six fifty that you're making on the pie, okay? So your gross profit margin is going to be 68% because you're going to divide that 650 by the 950 that you're selling it for. Now let's break this down. It's the same way we just did on the napkin test. It will cost us 34000 a year to operate the bakery. This includes an underdraw of 16000 So break even equals the 34000 divided by our, our gross profit margin. So we're going to have to have $50,000 in sales, annual sales. Well, how many pies is that a year? 
So you start breaking it down. You know, how many pies is that a week? How many pies is that in a day? You know, and you break it down, 102 pies per week divided by five days equals 21 pies per day. Now, that's a lot of pies. So you have to really start thinking and, and do your due diligence. You know, can I really sell 21 pies a day? Can I really make 21 pies per day? You know, you've got to think about pies want to sell every day of the year. Are you basing this on how many days per week? Five days a week, 52 weeks a year. Hmm, I don't know. I really want to do that. You figure out, you know, everything that you have in sales, how how much your gross profit margin is, how much sale per year that you need to sell per year, that you're hoping to sell per year. You've got to make sure that your cash man management cycle never has a break in it. And you can see here um, how it got, you know, you buy, sell, you collect the money, you pay again, your account's payable to buy the supplies again. Um, you purchase inventory. So you, if this cash cycle has a break at any time, then it's going to hurt your cash flow. And a lot of businesses sometimes will have to close if their cash flow, if there's so much to the negative, they can't get ahead. And it'd be by making um, bad decisions on, uh, and I've had a business this happened to before, they said, okay, well, we've got a really good deal on the inventory. We can purchase so many boxes of this inventory that we need, even though we're not going to sell it till next year. But as cheap as we can get it, um, it'd be crazy for us not to do it. And I'm like, well, you know, you've got to really weigh that out. You have the money to pay for it because if you're going in the hole and you can't pay your other bills and you're going to stop your other other inventory from coming in, it's not worth it. So is it really a good deal? So they have to really think about it. But what happens? to the cash when we buy too much inventory. You know, if we buy too much inventory and we're not selling it and it's sitting on the shelf, then we're not going to have money coming in for that. What happens to our business cash flow if customers don't pay us on time? You know, if our collections are at hand and we have an accounts receivable set up and people are um, not paying us on time, then if we don't have that big nest egg sitting there full of cash, it's going to be hard for us to continue purchase inventory and to stay in business if they're not paying us. Um, so what if, what happens if our cash flow to our cash flow if we don't sell as much as we have projected? Um, we're working with a client. We help them with doing projections, and it's really hard to project, you know, two years out, three years out, because you don't know. You don't know. You're hoping, you know, that's what you're hoping to sell. So if you don't at any time, you've got to have that plan in place. What if, what if, what if. Um, so what could happen to our cash flow then if we don't pay our vendors? You know, if we don't pay our expenses on time, they're not going to ship things to us. Our power is going to be shut off. We might be evicted from the, from the stage we're winning. So sometimes, you know, going back to the pies and you're thinking, yeah, I can bake so many pies a day, but then when you get down to can I sell 21 pies five days a week, well, you know, it's not such a good idea. No matter what the product or service the customer that we're working with offers, sometimes it, it talks out of going into business because thinking, you know, I really didn't look at it like that. I didn't take that objective look at it. I was just thinking I like to make pies, I like to sell them. So you really have to put that into consideration when you're doing this. Okay, when you have when you're still building the house, and you can see now we're on the second floor on the cash flow planning. Um, you've got to know how to operate it, and and it comes from also the cash flow. You've got to know how to do your cash flow. You've got to know how to market the business. And you've got to be able to have access to credit if you need it. So you, that's why you need to make sure that your credit is also in line as a business owner. So we in now to the core four. And I went through the, the core three with the cash flow um, kind of fast, but it's kind of hard um, to go through some of the cash flow without having you with your pencil paper and, and your calculators actually doing some little exercises 
But hopefully some of you all can attend um, the next time we have it and be able to do more if you want to learn more about cash flow. You've got to think about your business problem. You know, you got to think um, crisis versus opportunity and how to make the best of that. Avoiding problems usually results in a crisis. So you've got to confront the problem so you can create an opportunity for success. You know, this ties back to the concept of having all the attitude when we discuss that in success planning. Um, and so many business owners, they they get afraid sometimes and they don't want to com be confronted with any problems. They don't want to deal with it. And I'll give you an example. Um, Mary starts a business and has a sign she has put up at her business business and the city makes sure to take the sign down because it doesn't comply with local sign ordinances. So, you know, whereas if, if she would have took care of this in the beginning, done homework, part of her business plan, you know, visited with the city zoning office before she purchased the building, before she put the sign up or did any of that, and done her research, she would have found out that um, she could have another building, another location, and then put the improvements in um, that would have been cheaper than this building that she has no sign. Because no sign is no, it means no business. They're not going to know you're there. So really, your homework um, when you're when you're working with a, opening a business, and teach your entrepreneurs that it's smart to do this because they kind of think everything's just going to fall in place for them, and that's not always the case. Um, and it's just like I said, uh, the same with the city and checking with the city ordinances when you're looking at a building. Um, when in, always go to the source of information. Um, the IRS, unfortunately, won't give you a break because you're a new business owner. They're going to expect you to know the law. And a lot of the business owners I work with, they will say, well, you know, I really know how to provide this service, whether it's, it could be lawn mowing. Um, but they don't want keep books. They want to deal with the IRS. They don't want to think about taxes. But unfortunately, um, they, you're going to have to because it's going to catch up with you and they will end up shutting your business down uh, because they they won't take I don't know um, as um, a solution for it. So if you have a question about your taxes, don't ask a friend that's in business. Don't ask a family member's work for it. Because um, another thing is, and as it says on your screen, the laws do change constantly. So there's a lot of fine print out there that you may miss. It could be different even for the type of business that you're doing. You know, so you need to make sure that um, you know the laws yourself and go directly to the source. Contact um, call your for your business that you can contact, and you also put this in your business plan. Um, will offer free consultations. Even if you go and check it out, you know, if you can't afford it right away, go and, and ask your questions and find out what it's going to cost you in the long run. Same thing with a CPA or an accountant. You need to have someone who knows the laws that can help you because if not, it's going to catch up with you. Make sure you go straight to the source. Then after you figure this out, you need to determine what type of business you're going to be. This is the hardest thing for a lot of entrepreneurs we work with, or either they'll just say, well, I'm just going to be a sole proprietor, but they really don't know what that means. And there's different types of businesses, business entities, and you've got to determine based on your business which one is best for you. I never tell any of the, the customers that I work with, they'll say, well, which one do you think I should do if they're going to draw it out of a hat? Now, you need to really look at all the um, advantages and disadvantages of each entity and decide which is best for you. You have a sole proprietor or you might be in a partnership. Um, it could be an LLC or you could be an, an S or C corporation. But you need to understand the pros and cons of each one of these and choose which one's best for you. As far as a partnership, I have worked with a lot of partnerships and I'll just tell you, a lot of times, um, they have disagreements. So this is one of the things I always say to them. Here's to you and here's to me. If we ever disagree, here's to me. And that's the truth. So you need to always plan your divorce before you're married in a partnership business. 
uh, because if something's wrong, and it's not if, it's usually when something goes wrong, you've got to have that plan in place as to, you know, who's going to get what in the business. And I have found a lot of them, um, this is a lot of times uh, an argument. You know, who has control of the checkbook? How many signatures are needed for a check? Does it require partners or just one? Uh, who can sign a lease? Purchase equipment? Um, who can get a business loan with a business? Does it have to be both of you? Do you both um, have to be there if there's a, a purchase? You know, think about these things. I have found that um, sometimes one partner wants to zig while the other one wants to zag, and that can become a problem for, for business owners. I've worked with several businesses and can't go into my story today. I don't have the time. I don't think you all want to stay on here till five or six o'clock. But um, several of the partnerships that I've worked with, unfortunately, I had a good friend that that went into a partnership one time. She had the good credit. She had the good collateral. She had everything she needed to run the business, except she didn't have time to run it. So she formed a partnership and hired another friend to be the partner in that business. Well, what happened, um, the other friend didn't have any vested interest. She didn't have good credit. She didn't have any collateral. Um, she didn't have anything really invested into that business. And so the partnership failed. You know, it all came back on the one friend who had all that ended up losing everything. So make sure you have everything in order when you do the partnership. Also, I, I'll talk more about um, taxes as well. Make sure that you have all the, the tax identification numbers that you need. Um, you may need a state tax identification number. If you have employees, make retail sales, there's a whole list of things. Contact your state revenue department to receive copies of an application and instructions on what you need to do as far as the state ID number. There's also the state workforce identification number. Businesses that have employees may be required to register with the State Workforce Center to receive that identification number. So make sure you do that. The number identifies you as a business, that identifies your business as an employer um, that who's required to pay the unemployment tax. So make sure that you have that. Also, um, the state sales and use tax permit. Um, you check with your state revenue department for, for for state sales and use tax and make sure that the permit shows that you're authorized to make retail sales and provide taxable services in that state. And then you have a federal employee identification number. This is um, a lot of people think of it as the EIN, the federal ID number. Um, if you're going to have employees, if you're going to have any form of business other than a sole proprietorship, then the business must have a federal employer identification number. Okay, and to, to get this, you go through your Internal Revenue Service and, and to get this number. I know Virginia, we, we make it really easy for people to go into business. We have a business one-stop that they can go online and it's a matter of asking, is this a new business or no, and what type of business are you going to be, for-profit, non-profit, depending. It's just a matter of clicking and going through it. And I know a lot of states have onto that now, but it sure makes it easy when you're starting a business to figure out how to start that business and how to do it the correct way. Your taxes are your responsibility, and you're not going to get a break because you're a um, small business owner or because you didn't know any better. The IRS and Uncle Sam, they don't care that you say it no. It's your responsibility. So make sure that you cover all the bases on, on your taxes filed correctly and pay them correctly. And different types of business tax. And at, there's five principal types of business taxes. You have business income tax. Um, every business must file an annual income tax return. So which form you use and how you pay your tax depends on the type of business that you have organized and the type of entity that you have. You have the self-employment tax. And um, the self-employment tax is Social Security and Medicare tax for sole proprietors, self-employed farmers, fishermen, members of a partnership. Um, so make sure that you're, you're filing the correct tax. You all have excise tax. 
And with that, if you manufacture or sell a certain type of product, you may have to pay an excise tax. Uh, there may also be um, an excise tax on certain types of businesses and the use of various kinds of equipment um, or facilities and products that you have. You have um, employment taxes. With employment taxes, you are required by the federal and most state laws to hold or pay employment taxes on their behalf. So this includes um, your federal tax, federal income tax withholding, um, your FIS, um, your Medicare taxes, the unemployment tax, um, anything that falls under the state income tax, state employment, anything that falls under that. Uh, and then again, you have your state, um, I mean your sales and use taxes. In some states, uh, sales tax applies to the gross receipts from selling, leasing, or renting items. Um, so make sure that you have the correct forms when you're doing this. Um, if you do not make taxable sales, um, but you make purchases uh, subject to use tax, then you must um, register to remit use tax. So make sure that you have the right things filled out for this. Types of employment relationships. Um, you've got to think of what type of employers uh, employees you have with your business. Um, you, if you choose to have employees, then you're going to be paying these taxes. You're going to be doing that. If you do independent, you may decide to hire just independent contractors where you don't have to provide all that extra um, that you have to as an employer. Whether or not actually the independent contractor is not going to actually be an employee of yours. So I have some businesses, depending on the business, that choose to you know, hire an independent contractor who is responsible for the own taxes rather than to hire them as an employee. I'm not going to go into detail on each one of these, but you all have insurances, um, and it depends on the business that you have as to what types of insurances you need. And this is something that you need to discuss uh, with your insurance agent and with your attorney to make sure you're covered depending on the type of business you have, um, as far as the liabilities you need to have covered, property damage, uh, workers' comp, health and medical. Um, and you may determine that you want to provide a health and medical insurance for your employees depending on how many you have. And you have to weigh all the costs. So there's a whole lot that goes into the insurance. And you, it just depends on the different type of, types of businesses. When we're working with folks one-on-one -on -one and providing technical assistance, um, this is something that a lot of them will go, you know, what do I need to have or what should I have? And this is where they need to, one, talk with their insurance agent and their attorney to make sure they're covered as a business owner as far as their insurances. And when you determine that, um, and it's like I said in the beginning, make sure you have a, an attorney and an accountant that you can call on. And don't feel bad. I, I have customers that will say, yeah, I have an attorney, but I feel like I'm bothering him. Well, as an entrepreneur, you can't feel like that. Remember, they work for you. Provide them, you know, if it wasn't for you, they wouldn't have a job. And so you need to make sure your accountant is part of your business support team. I was working with a business not long ago, and they said they meet with their accountant or talk with someone in that office that's a CPA at least once a month. They go over and drop off all their sales and all their information, and make sure you have that relationship built with them. You want to be comfortable with them. You want to be able to respect them and trust them, and you want the same in return um, because you don't want things, you don't want any surprises to show up should you have an audit in the future. Make sure you keep records. Um, I work with some businesses, and it's funny because if you've asked to see their records, you know they're scrolling around. Well, this is last month. You know where the other ones are. You know that's not work. Should you get audited? So make sure you keep good records. It has to be done because um, if not, you're going to pay for it in the end. You know, and you do not want that to happen. You want to make sure that um, you understand how to keep those records. You monitor them. If someone else is doing them for you, 
because when it all comes said done, you're going to be responsible for it. So I always ensure that my clients know that. Your supplier, you want to make it make it to where your suppliers know that you're a good source. Um, when you're purchasing for them, you know you want to make sure that you you pay them on time. A lot of them will offer discounts, and a lot of people that we work with, they'll set up an account sometimes with their suppliers, and that's not a bad idea. And I always say, and it says on your screen, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You always have have one more than one source. So if you purchase inventory, make sure you're just not purchasing the inventory from one person. Make sure one vendor. Make sure you spread out and you have several vendors. And that way you've got a resource. If something happened with that vendor, you've got other ones you can work with. Um, consider the vendor services as well as the price. And some of us working with one of my clients he was purchasing from from a couple of vendors that offered discounts if he paid um, his bill within 10 days. Uh, it was a it was like a 10 percent discount. Well, if he was able to do that um, and it didn't mess his cash flow up too much, that's a great idea to be able to do that um, because you never know um, when you're going to need other sources as well. And so he uses them for most of the things he can pay on time. Maybe the smaller purchases. But then the other vendors he uses, they offer a free freight. Um, maybe they have um, delivery every day or once a week. You know, it could be quicker than the other ones. Um, but if they give you a credit term and you are and you pay them monthly, make sure you do. Make sure, just like they want them to keep their promises to you, you keep your promises to them. And I always talk about customer service, um, but this this is what it boils down to most every time. Um, it's far, far easier and less expensive to keep current customers rather than find a new one. Um, and if you don't have customers, you're not going to have a business. And so many times, um, I, my customers, my clients get tired of me saying it, but you've got to learn. I, I've had some that are really good at selling um, their product or maybe making that product, they don't want to deal with, with a lot of folks they need to, a lot of the companies they need to. And I'm like, you've got to be, remember you have internal customers and you have external customers. You've got to be ready to sell to everybody. And you also want to keep your character, your image, and remember you're the face for that business. So what you do or say to people makes a huge difference. Um, it's about forming that relationship. Um, people want to know that you care about them, um, and you care that you provided that service in a, a, a way to totally satisfy them, and they're getting a good value for their money. So you want to you want to have superior customer service, and that's the easiest way to beat out your customers. I may pay a little more for something because I know I'm going to get a good a good response, and I know I can count on, on that person I'm buying it from. If it's not right, they're going to make it right. So remember that and as far as customer service. When you're working with clients and um, in teaching your clients, um, good customer service is important. And another reason it's important is because of social media today. You know, we all have this smartphone, so it's really easy for us to hop on, you know, a social media site and say something bad about a business. Um, so remember that as far as for your business as well as for your agency in remembering that. Um, and then we're going to go for your business. Um, remember, 7 out of 10 complaining customers will do business with you again if you resolve the complaint in their favor. And if you resolve it on the spot, 95% will do business with you again. I say that, um, and when I say resolve it in their favor, does that mean you have to give them exactly what they want? Not necessarily, but it means that you need to be, um, you need to make them valued and at least meet them somewhere. If you're not able to give them whatever it is, the complaint they have, you know, replace it or maybe it's partially their fault, whatever happened, um, it, but let them know that they're getting the better end of the deal because you want them to keep coming back. And never let anyone leave your business upset or mad. You know, resolve it on the spot. 95% will do business with you again. 
if you resolve it on the spot. So make sure you do that. And you want to run through and think about the what ifs with the business. Um, it's your business dress rehearsal. You know, what if people call in sick? Um, what if you forgot the cash? What if you're sick? Because as a business owner, um, you can't really afford to be sick. So you've got to make sure um, that you work all those bugs um, before you make a bad or a poor impression on your customers. Make sure that's very important. Um, and by doing this work, you'll be able to determine if your business idea is is feasible, if it's viable, viable I'll get it out, and um, is my plan desirable? Um, because if not, and, and your son, and you can see up there in the left-hand corner, if your son stops shining with this, um, the business cannot grow. So that's extremely important. You want to make sure when you ask yourself all three of those questions, and you would ask yourself in every part of the course, um, in each one of the course, ask yourself, is this plan I'm writing feasible? Is, this, is my plan viable? Is my plan desirable? Uh, some won't shine unless all three of these are, are yeses. So you need to make sure that you have all three of those and your business is in order in order to have a good business idea and for it for it to be successful. Um, I went through this kind of quick because uh, we're pressed for time, but we do have a few minutes um, if anybody has any questions. Um, so our RV don't have any uh, questions pop up, but maybe maybe someone has a question now that they want to type in. Or ask or raise your hand. So feel free to do so. I thought that was very very good information that Beth shared, um, particularly as it relates to the legal of things. Uh, if you are looking to set up. A you know a social enterprise or a for profit arm. Only want to you know the lawyer is going to be your best 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 friend because of the fact that uh, you know you have the nonprofit side of the house and everything needs to stay stay separate. As well as if you're helping business owners, I caution against giving legal advice. Stay away from that. Always point them to the lawyer. So. Um, do you have anything else to say about that, Becky? Can you hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure if, you, if anyone could hear me. Um, and and to say the same, we have a lot of folks that don't realize the importance that they have. They need to get that relationship established with their attorney, the relationship established with their lawyer, and and that is extremely important. Um, they think they can just you know write whatever they need down and take care of it themselves or just ignore it. So it goes back to what I was talking about with the crisis um, and opportunity situations. You know, if you do your homework, um, you'll have more opportunities versus having more more crisis in, in the business. And I keep telling folks that when we're working with them. Yeah. That's, that's good information. Do you have any questions? Either, either Beth, you did an excellent, <laughs> yeah. you did a very, very excellent job, or folks are just take all in. It's a lot of information taken, especially when you're talking about cash flow and that, that sort of thing. That's that's um. So I, I used to be a business development manager. Uh, I'd be in business, Becky's role at one point in my life too. I always used to contract out the uh, the cash flow statements and stuff too. Uh, I don't know, Becky, you you, you probably uh, do them yourself, but. Um, but to get someone like uh, an accountant or a bookkeeper or someone to come in and teach those because uh, it's, it's all detail. Well, with the cash flow, a lot of times, if we help them, but a lot of times, just for another view, um, since a lot of times we're helping them with the financing, then I will send them to the Small Business Development Center and Fine. let them get another view on the business, you know, plus. Um, and as well as work with them on the business plan too. You know, they can take what we've helped them with and go up, go up to the small business development center, and add more things even to it. You know, such as the 
demographics and, and other things. So um, that, that works out really good. They can also tell you they'll, they'll pull from whatever state you're in. The Small Business De Development Center has access to tell you how many businesses are like yours in that community, in that area, so you can have a better idea. Yes. Looks like um, Daniel has a question. What I'm going to do is just unmute you, Daniel. You should be able to speak out. Okay, thanks. Um, excellent. I didn't really. My, my only question is, are this going to be on the website? Yeah, we're going to um, put these slides on the website. I'm also going to email you a copy of the um, the link to it, as well as uh, the recording, so you can go back and listen to the recording if you missed anything. So, yep, we'll have available for you. Thanks. Glad it. Any other questions? Okay. I guess we'll press through the next set of slides, and then if there's any other questions, and we'll answer them at that time. I just want you guys to be aware that uh, Becky is available by email, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. So um, with her there, and there's her contact information. You can always send her an email question directly. Um, make sure we don't have any other questions. And after the last through. time, Linda, all of them, that's what they did. They would send me e I, I would have emailed questions. And that that's great, too, if you want to send okay. questions by email. I'll be happy to help. Great. Right. Well, that's good. Maybe people are a little shy with opening up on the line. <laughs> um, here's the par partnership information. Uh, Stacy Flowers. Many of you may know her. She is the director of CED, and here's her telephone number and her email. She is currently in um, now. She's graduating from Ox Oxford University, so she is getting her um, her doctorate in uh, innovation. So she is over there and uh, getting that. So we're excited about that for her. And so she is her. Um, Contact information, and also I'm very, very excited to announce that the there's a call for entries for the nominations for the uh, Excellence Award. Excuse me, oh gosh, that's my the other side of my house, not the Excellence Award, <laughs> the CED Entrepreneurship and Innovation Award. I, I wear two hats here, guys. Um, so okay, the deadline is July 11th, and if you have a project that your agency is currently um, operating, you want to submit to be um, considered for an award by the membership. By all means, please, please, please submit your project. Uh, We've got um, applications that are available on our website at communityactionpartnership.com, or you can go to partnershipced.org. And I should have put that on the, on the slide as well. That's partnership. CED.org, and then of, um, the community partnership website as well. But um, we have about, I think it's six different categories that you can win, and we will uh, be announcing the award winners in uh, our uh, annual conference from the 19th to the 22nd. I think the actual award ceremony is on, the, on that last day on the 22nd. So um, Becky's agency. People Incorporated. They win almost. Well, they've won every year. So they last year they got the Master Innovator Award for um, to their economic development objects. Yeah. So they have some some wonderful, wonderful things they're doing over there. So please, please, please submit those, and we will be happy to receive them. Uh, um, at this time, I don't see any other questions that have come through. Oh wait, um, that's not a question. Nope. So. You guys are kind of quiet today. I don't know if you guys are over here in this 99-degree uh, weather like I am. Maybe it's the heat. <laughs> but um, we will go ahead and send the information to you. So if there are any other questions, we will um, end the webinar. I show that we have only six, six minutes left. But um, in all means, like Becky said, you can send questions to her. You can send anything to Stacy or I if you um, have any partnership-related questions. Okay? So I just want to thank you all for joining us. And we look forward to your participation on our next webinar, which will be up in July.
the latter part of July, last two weeks in July, we have a few that are coming up, and we will keep you posted by e-news as well as on our website. So please stay tuned for those. Okay, Becky. Thank you. Thank you everyone for participating. Oh, and there's a survey afterwards. So after you sign off, there will be a survey that will ask you about three to four questions. Please time to fill that out so we can hear from you and know what type of workshops we should webinars we should offer, um, so that you'll, um, you know, be satisfied with what, you're, what we're bringing to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.